guys, and welcome to another WFM Tipsy Thursdays. I am your show host, Juanita Coley, the Contact Center Whisperer, and I am super, super excited today because we're talking about call arrival patterns. What is call arrival patterns and what does it have to do with the contact center in the first place? What does it have to do with workforce management? I'm so glad you asked. I never thought you would. So this episode, we have the amazing Jen Jones with us. Jen, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Absolutely. So we're going to hop right in because I don't want to waste the people's time. Okay. Let's hop right in. First of all, tell me, um, when, when did you fall in love with workforce management? Like that's a thing that people typically fall into. So tell me when did you fall in love with workforce management? <laughs> that's, that's very true. I did fall into it. So at first I was, uh, at a company, I was in technical support, love getting my, you know, hands dirty, understanding the ins and outs of the product and everything. And I wanted to be challenged a little bit more. I was already in leadership. I love numbers. Right. And I always wanted to understand the why behind everything and the decisions that were happening in the company. So I figured, you know what, why not be at the table and understand why these decisions are happening and what is causing a lot of the conversation and, you know, budget and things like that. So lo and behold, I applied for a position in that company and I got it and and in my heart just went, you know what I mean? So that's when I knew that this is what it really meant to be in WFM and what WFM actually meant and how much it's involved in most companies that people don't even know. Oh my God. That's now that's a whole, see, didn't I tell you that's a whole nother conversation (laughs) in and of itself, because that's an episode, like what is all involved in workforce management that, Mm -hmm. you know, people don't even know, like, what are all the things, but we're not, Stay focused, Juanita. Stay focused, okay? (laughs) So, (laughs) Jen, tell me. So, we're talking about call arrival patterns today. In your own words, tell me, what is arrival patterns? Uh, So, for me, it just depends on what we're we're measuring, right? So, when when I think of call arrival patterns, I think of call types, right? How did the person even get to my queue or get to call my number, and how are they identifying themselves? And then the back end of that is what is the outcome of the report that I'm looking for? Am I looking for time of day? Am I looking for who it is? Am I, you know, demographically? Um, Is also what are they looking for inside the call? Is it a billing, troubleshooting, a product? You know, so arrival patterns can mean a variety of different things, but it's all about how did the customer reach us and when did they reach us and why did they reach us and how did they reach us? for me. Yeah, absolutely. I'll never forget when uh, my first real like understanding of arrival patterns and I was in an organization doing some forecasting and the forecast would always be dead spot on, right? Like, you know, you know, in forecasting, you have a, you know, an acceptable era of or yeah. a margin of error from a forecasting perspective. Yeah. And yeah. these th- in, inside of this particular organization that shall remain nameless, right? Um, <laughs> the forecast was always dead spot on. Like, if we said we was getting 1300 calls, that's what we were getting 1300 calls. Right. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason at this particular time, um, they were continuing to fail on service levels. Mm -hmm. And so they kept saying, we are, our forecasters are amazing and da da da. da. So I'm, I'm going in, I'm looking at, um, the forecast I'm looking at all the inputs and all the things. And I noticed that, Yeah, you're getting the 1300 calls or you're getting whatever it was for that day. But the way your calls arrive, right, is drastically off. Right. So the arrival patterns are drastically off, which, as you already know, has a direct impact on how we're staffing. So it doesn't matter at the end of the day if I was dead on for 1300 calls, if I predicted I was going to get 500 in the a.m. and I really got, I don't know. 100. And in the yeah. afternoon, I said I was going to get 100 and I got a thousand calls, right? Uh, because exactly. how I'm going to staff for that AM interval was going to be completely different than how we have staffed for the PM interval, which means it's going to directly impact the service level. And so when I think about call arrival patterns, it's direct, it's exactly what you said, right? It's what are those calls? How are those calls getting to me? How do they arrive? Right. Mm-hmm. And who's yep. calling about what, which is again, whole nother conversation. So anyway, (laughs) I I loved your, I love your, I love your piece there. So give me uh, two things I want to ask you. Mm -hmm. Um, One is what is a common, 
in the in the same theme of arrival patterns, when we think about um, a common myth or challenge with working with call arrival, right? When we think about forecasting and scheduling, what is a common myth or challenge, right? Of understanding the impacts of the calls and how they arrive. I would say one of the largest challenges that I noticed just in conversation is that people underestimate the tenure of the person taking the calls mm. because that matters. So that just to your example, you say, say you get 500 calls in the AM, right? Well, if that person's calling about something pretty complex and you have a newer, you know, not experienced employee, that average handle time is not something that we're, we're taking care of, right? In the variables. And we may be having a measurement of average channel time, but are we really looking into who is answering that call? So now you could have, let's say you need, you know, you have 10 agents, they handle about hundred calls, but can they actually handle 200? So as we're looking at the arrival patterns, but how many staff do we need to actually take care of that arrival pattern is something that's usually missed, especially when we're thinking of the tenure of that person. So I would say that's usually like a pain point, you know, that I've noticed in conversation and what we when what we forecast of is that is usually a variable we take a look into. That's really good. And that is so very true, which is why I think it's so important when we think about like how we onboard employees mm -hmm. and their training, all those different things. Workforce, I say I have a, I have a video up where I talk about workforce management needing to be in a all up in HR's business and HR needs <laughs> to be all up in workforce management business. Because yeah. when we think about the training and onboarding, we need to understand that this is happening because we need to take that into consideration as we are forecasting. When I say, oh, okay, these calls are going to come in like this, who do I have on the phone? Is this a, you know, is these, is this a new hire class that just hit the, hit the floor? And so their average handle time is going to be higher at this particular time where I have a peak of my volume coming in. Um, <laughs> do I need to account for higher AHT during those times? So many different things. Um, and, yep. and with the landscape of conversation right now around AI and how we implement um, maybe like just in time learning, those types of things are, I think, really critical when we think about how we support our agents, especially yeah. our new hire staff. Um, when we think about employee experience, anyway, don't, don't get me down the rabbit hole of employee <laughs> experience. Hey, hey, hey there. It's Juanita Coley here. And I want to personally invite you to book a WFM discovery call where we will talk through what your CX customer experience and your EX employee experience goals are for your organization and how you can obtain them by leveraging the WFM discipline. Yes, that's right. Workforce management and operations can work hand in hand together. And I want to talk to you about your goals. How can you have culture and have it efficiently? How can you achieve customer experience without sacrificing on employee experience? That's what we're going to be talking about. So click the link, schedule your call at WFMBuildingBridges.com. And I am excited to dive deep with you. See you soon. The next question I have, though, for you is around what are some of the benefits to contact centers um, when workforce management professionals really understand the call arrival patterns? How can workforce management and operations work together better when they understand their call arrival patterns? What, what are some of your thoughts around that? Biggest benefit, I would say, would be a need of staff. Right. Also, as a business, you need to find out, you know, what's the best business hours that you need to be open for. Mm. And sometimes I don't know if you ever call the company. Right. And they're a 24 hour business. Right. But how many calls do they actually get overnight? Is it worth staying open that long? Right. The amount of time and money they're paying for staff to be there. Do we need them there or can we essentially just put them somewhere where we actually do need them? When you're thinking of a budget perspective as well. Right. And you want to give time back or also employee engagement when you want to vto people or you want to offer more pto those things are really really good to know so you can increase those opportunities for people but if you have no idea when when calls are coming in how they're coming in and who's assisting them and taking those calls it's really hard to manage your budget and, and manage the employee engagement i love 
that. Those hours of what we used to call hoops, right? Uh, I don't yeah. know if people still call it hoops or not. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm showing my age. Uh, but yeah. when we think about hours of operations, um, for those, that's why we call it hoops, hours yeah. of operations, right? Um, so when we think about uh, hours of operations, when we understand those call arrival patterns, just like you said, many times people be picking, uh, companies be picking just like, oh yeah, we need to be open 24 hours or we need these types of shifts. And I'm like, well, what is the schedule analysis on that? Like what's the cost benefit yeah. of, of that? Mm -hmm. Are you paying more to have people around the clock? Or even if you're not a 24 hour, are you paying more money for people to be available during these hours of operations, whether it's, exactly. you know, eight to five or, you know, eight to 11 PM, what is mm -hmm. the cost benefit analysis of those shifts and how do your calls arrive? If you have four calls that come in at 11 PM, Unless it's some contracting requ requirement, exactly. right? You know, exactly. like uh, it's a healthcare, you have a you have obligation yes. to stay yep. open or you are 911 emergency services, mm -hmm. right? We can't just be closing because it's only one call. Somebody life and death are calling at 11. You need to answer the phone, right? Yeah. Uh, so unless it's contract or it is emergency services or something like that, I think we have to really understand. And I think that's the benefit that you're articulating, right? It's really understanding what is that cost analysis? What is, you know, um, be, and, and being able to convey that rather. Right. Workforce management being able to convey that to the overall business to say, hey, based on our arrival patterns at 11 mm -hmm. p.m., we get one call and it's a French call at that. So, you know, not that it's anything against you know, speaking French, but I'm saying like, that's not the majority of our volume. So it doesn't make sense for us to have five people staffed here at, you know, 11 PM for one, you know, one call, you know, one, one Spanish call, one French call, one Portuguese, one English, it doesn't matter what the language is. Right. Um, right. And so I think that that's really, really important. You may have different hoops for that specific language that is necessary as well. And I think that's something that people have to look into because the language line is not the solve all for all customers, right? So sometimes you have to adjust your business. That's so amazing. Like I, like I said, we can talk about this topic for forever. What's something else that I haven't asked that in your experience working in uh, workforce management that has been like a aha or I, I got you around arrival patterns or call types that you're like, man, people really should pay more attention to this. If, if there's anything you want to share that I haven't asked. Um, I would probably say it as, not, as we're talking about and I'm, and I'm thinking it through. Um, it's really important to, to understand the product that you are, that you have as a company. Right. And, and I think, the reason I say that is if you know you have a complex product, please don't assume, right, that the customer's gonna be on the phone and off the phone just just like that, right? Recognize the product that you own, right? And I the reason I say that is because a lot of times when we're going through variables of average speed of answer, or sometimes it's contractual of like service levels, right, and, and things like that. When you when you're like, yeah, you know what, we can do a hundred percent service level, 20 second ASA. That is a astounding service level if anybody agrees to it right but i think people need to be really much more realistic in in explaining to people why that's not necessarily logistically possible right because one nobody wants to be um penalized for that right and, and held at such a high standard where so many variables can happen but if you're actually telling somebody hey you actually don't receive many calls throughout the day right so you may be this huge huge customer but you only get maybe 10 calls in the morning, maybe 30 calls at night, and in the middle it sometimes sprinkles. And sometimes because we realize they have such a low call and we immediately say yes. So I think people just need to understand what's the product, what are you being measured at, right? And actually understand what that looks like when they call in. Do you have a higher chance of a, a, a large abandonment rate? Is that something you really want to be measured by? And I think that's something that we need to kind of take into consideration before we say yes. Right. And just start saying yes to everything um, and play devil's advocate with yourself. Right. Do you I really understand their rival patterns or am I just looking at this cool looking graph? Right. But it, and I, but it's not necessarily telling me the story or anything. And I'd also challenge people to listen to some calls, listen to what people are on the phone and you'll have a much better understanding of 
is it average handle time? You know, is it the product? Is it us? Do we need to change our training? You know what I mean? So I think we just kind of have to take a second, take a step back before we just assume the data is the data sometimes, maybe before we make changes. I absolutely love that because one thing that I don't think people realize a lot of times is that um, workforce management people get, especially if you've ever done forecasting, you understand that it's much harder to forecast for small cues um, than it is larger. Right? Like if, if I get one call every four hours, I don't mm-hmm. know when that call is going to come in versus in larger yeah. queues, right? When I know on average, I get 30 calls every 30 minutes or, you know, 300 calls every 30 minutes. My margin of error is going to be much smaller than um, yeah. in smaller queues. And so to your point, understanding that call arrival, understanding the size of the queue, understanding, I love that you said, listen to the calls. Like you, you dropped a lot of gems. You, you, in that last question, you dropped a lot of gems just in that last piece. That's a whole those are like three separate episodes right there. I just want y'all to know. So we come, we bringing Jen back. Okay. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Um, it was so much that I think we have to unpack. Sounds good. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Man, was that not, I told y'all we were going to cover a lot of territory. So I love that Jen cover, you know, really understanding and articulating to the operations, right? What the, what that call arrival looks like working with the business to not only understand what the arrival looks like, but also figuring out, you know, one of the benefits to understanding workforce, working with operations and understanding what that call arrival looks like is hoops to hours of operation. We, we covered that ground and that is so, so very true. Also, really understanding whether or not to say yes to um, or or what your yes will be like when we're thinking about contractually the the service level agreements that you're going to be saying yes to those how you're going to be penalizing under looking at the call volume to understand okay, is this something that I can actually do? How do calls arrive or contacts period, right? Because it may not always just be calls. It may be emails. It could be chats. It could be whatever the customer interaction is, is, is super, super key. So like, again, amazing conversation. I hope that this was beneficial to you guys. You already know what to do. If there is a question, a workforce management contact center question um, that you want to cover, make sure you send me a message because I want to cover it here on WFM Tipsy Thursdays. Until next time, y'all go be great and let's make impact. See y'all soon. Bye.